Hello everyone and thank you for joining me for the online sermon here at St Jude's. We're returning to our series in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and the, the passage that I'm going to be reading and then speaking to us on is from chapter 4 verses 1 to 7. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each one will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Well, it's a fairly normal thing these days to have a career change. Someone I know went from being an electrician to a policeman. Another person I know went from being a dentist to a librarian. Another that I uh, know went from being a finance guy to a policeman, which sounds like a very, very big change indeed. Many of the people in Christian ministry in our circles have been through a career change. I would say most of the people with whom I studied for Christian ministry at Moore College had been doing something else. They were scientists, they were engineers, they were accountants, they were school teachers, uh, whatever it may be. When somebody goes through a career change, it's a normal thing to ask them, oh, what made you change? People often ask me uh, why I changed to do what I do now. People are curious because they figure that with Christian ministry, the reason is not going to be one of the usual ones, like, well, it's better money or to spend more time with my family. Now this raises the question, what a Christian minister is. And in tackling this question, uh, it's not just that I want to talk about me, it's actually what the, the passage which we've just read speaks about, isn't it? The opening verse of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 teaches that it is important for all of us to think rightly about what a Christian minister is. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. This then is how you ought to regard us. Now it makes sense that this is important. If you are part of any group, whether it's a church or any other sort of group, it's important to know what the leader is there for and what they should be trying to achieve. Uh, now, if you're part of the group that we call Australia, then in a few weeks' time, when we vote in the federal election, we will have to think about what the leader of Australia is there for and what they should be trying to achieve. So in the church context, what is the minister? I thought about the way people view us. I think that people view us partly as a community leader, like the mayor or the school headmistress or the rotary president. Partly, perhaps, people view us as a service provider, someone who's in the business of organising events which people want to go to. Uh, someone you go to for a wedding or a funeral or for an occasional boost through a special church service. Although, I suppose perhaps quite a few people these days see us as a niche market and one that they're not very interested in. Partly, uh, people just see us as uh, misfits. One man at my previous church said he was in favour of the clergy wearing dog collars because he knew to cross to the other side of the street when he saw one coming. Well, none of those viewpoints quite capture it. Uh, but in turning to 1 Corinthians 4 for guidance on what a minister is, I'm aware that 
Paul is speaking about himself as an apostle, which is it's a special role that only existed in the generation after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, me and my more college mates and our ministry team here at St Jude's, uh, we are not apostles. Uh, but I do think that what Paul writes here is broadly applicable to all Christian leadership and we can make the, the, the necessary distinctions along the way. Now, you can tell me at the door on Sunday morning if you disagree with the, the leaps that I've made. Well, this is the first point on the outline that I've published. Those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Uh, you see, here is the way that Paul teaches the Corinthians that they should think about Paul himself and the other apostles. Chapter 4, verse 1. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. So, these apostles, they're not primarily community leaders, they're not primarily service providers, uh, or misfits, you'll be glad to know, but they are trustees. They have received a sacred trust from Jesus himself, the mysteries of God revealed. Now, I was reluctant to raise uh, the, the story of that silly book that was written nearly 20 years ago now, The Da Vinci Code, because it really was rather silly, but it may help to clarify something for us because of the, the language here of secrets and mysteries. Uh, now, the Da Vinci Code traded on this idea, which, which already existed before Dan Brown wrote the book, that there's some sort of secret society out there which traces its existence right back to the early days of Christianity, which has been preserving and keeping a secret certain information which could bring the whole Christian faith down. Now, I have heard real-life people say to me that they believe such a society might exist. I don't think I need to go into how ridiculous that idea is. But it's useful to compare it with what is meant here by Paul explaining that he has been entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Paul and the other apostles were not entrusted with God's mysteries so that they could keep them a secret. It was quite the opposite of that. They were entrusted with these mysteries so that they could make them clearly known and so that they could establish communities in which the true doctrine of Jesus would be not only known but also believed and lived out. Now the apostles accomplished their work in two main ways. Firstly, by writing the New Testament so that the doctrine of Jesus is preserved now for all generations. And secondly, by founding churches throughout the Mediterranean, and those churches which were founded in the first decades after Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, they set Christianity on the stunning growth trajectory that it followed, well, certainly very, very strongly for those first few centuries after Jesus, but really uh, for the last 2,000 years. The mysteries or secrets uh, which we're talking about here are simply those body of uh, secrets of mysteries now revealed which make up the gospel. Uh, the fact that God always had a plan to do what nobody expected, to send his own son to be a sin offering. No one had guessed that, no one had guessed that human sin was such a dreadful problem. No one had guessed that God loved us so much that he would send his own son. But this was the, the, the mystery that was revealed that those Old Testament prophecies had pointed towards this event, which nobody had seen coming. Nobody had seen that our human plight was so bad or that God was so good as to send his son to be the sin offering for us. Now these mysteries, well, they're not a secret at all now anymore, are they? The apostles discharged their, their duty, the, the trusteeship that God had given them, that Jesus had given them. And, and nothing can change that now because the gospel has been written down. It's there in the New Testament for us. Uh, th th so that means that the task of 
the subsequent Christian leaders is a slightly different trusteeship now. Uh, what we have to do is to protect and to pass on the gospel as it's written in the New Testament to the next generation. And uh, Paul talks about that when he's writing to his protege, Timothy, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So all Christian leaders now, and really, in a real sense, all Christians, are trustees of the mysteries of God, which is the gospel. Now, the core nature of the role, uh, the role of the Christian leader, determines the core requirements. So if, if as Christian leaders we were entertainers, then the core requirement would be to be entertaining. Uh, if, if we were event organisers, well then the main requirement would be to be well organised and to put on a good show. But since we are trustees, the main requirement is the one that Paul explains in verse 2. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Now, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If you're a trustee, and the other Bible word for this is steward, right? if you're a trustee or a steward, then what you're doing is you're looking after something on behalf of someone else, and your job is to protect it. Uh, this concept often comes up in our everyday lives. For example, if you're moving house, well, you give your furniture to your removalists, and they are meant to look after your furniture and deliver it to your new house in the same condition as when they picked it up from your old house. Uh, you might house mind for your friend when they go on holidays. And in that case, what you should do is keep the house in the same condition, don't throw any wild parties, and water the plants so that they don't die. Now, as a trustee, your responsibilities are limited uh, for example, perhaps you are dog-sitting. Now, if you are out walking your friend's dog, and if it's an ugly dog, and somebody says, what an ugly dog you have, well, you can put your hand on your heart and say, well, that's not my problem. It's not my dog. A steward of the mysteries of God is a messenger, and their task is to pass on accurately the message they receive from God. The message is not from us. So if there's a part of the message that anyone doesn't like, please don't shoot the messenger. Now I've got to admit I'm feeling quite apprehensive about some of the sermons coming up in our series in 1 Corinthians in a few weeks. Uh, when we look at chapters 6 and 7, and we tackle the subjects of sex and marriage. Now, I feel as though I might be a messenger who gets shot. But that wouldn't be fair, would it? Because if I'm a trustee of the mysteries of God, of what God has revealed once for all to humanity, well, my task is to be a faithful passer on of that message. It isn't up to me to change the message or to select parts not to talk about. And this brings me to my second point. Uh, and I'm sorry that the, the heading is not very catchy, but the second point is no human has the right to judge the trustee. If you think about it, even if I do become the messenger who gets shot, it shouldn't really bother me, should it? I should only care about the opinion of my master the one who gave me the message to pass on. Who cares if the majority in Allison Park think that my friend's dog is ugly? As long as I'm bringing my dog, bringing her dog, I should say, back to her in one piece, then my friend will be happy. And that's why Paul says in verse 3 that he cares very little if he is judged by the Corinthians or by any human arbiter. You see, that's not the audience that he's playing to. And actually, it's a really good thing for the congregation uh, if, if they have someone whom they can trust to tell them the truth. Who can you trust to tell you the truth? Well, it's got to be someone who doesn't need your approval, doesn't it? 
It's got to be that. You don't want me to have a desperate need for your approval. Because if I did, I might withhold a part of the truth that I'm worried won't be pleasing to you. Paul then says something quite interesting. He says he doesn't even judge himself. Instead, he goes on, the end of verse 4, he says, It is the Lord who judges me. Now, verse 4 shows that he still has an active conscience. So when he says he doesn't judge himself, he doesn't mean that he doesn't listen to his conscience. He clearly does. And he would, he would respond if his conscience were troubling him. But not even a clear conscience is proof that he's innocent. He says, it is the Lord who judges me. That's, that's the motto. So there's no place for us to go about smugly with a clear conscience. Just because we can't think of anything that's against us, uh, that, look, we, are, we have a great power to trick ourselves, don't we? But the other side of the conscience coin is, is some good news and some comforting news which we ought to take to heart. Sometimes our own conscience can be too tough on us, can't it? So it's helpful to remember that we are God's servants and not the servants of our own perfectionism. I have a bad habit, occasionally, of calling myself stupid. A psychologist once told me that if my children hear me saying that, they'll project it onto themselves and they'll think that they're stupid. Well, that absolutely struck fear into my heart and once I heard that, I tried not to call myself stupid in the hearing of my children. But really, I should go further than that, shouldn't I? You see, it's not up to me to say that I'm stupid. God, not, not I, is the one who judges me. Now, as 21st century Australian people, uh, we find this a difficult idea because we have been taught that we are sovereign over ourselves. Uh, we think we have every right to call ourselves stupid, like it, it might not be a good choice, but we think we've got every right to call ourselves whatever we want because we think that each one of us owns ourselves. That isn't true. Not even I have the right to judge me. It's God who does that. It is a universal truth that God has the right to judge you and me. And specifically, uh, coming back to this discussion about the trustees of gospel truth, God is the one whose opinion matters. The messenger shouldn't care too much about human opinion, even their own. Because, and this is my third point, God has set a day when he will judge. Jesus will come, everyone will see him, and Jesus, whom God has appointed the judge of the living and the dead, Jesus will give his verdict on all of us. That's why Paul says in verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Uh, often in competitions there is an expert judge, but then there's also the People's Choice Award. Uh, they have that, for example, at the Archibald Prize, the portrait competition. Uh, we've, in our family, been watching Lego Masters lately, a TV Lego building competition, if you're not familiar with it. And uh, they have an expert judge. He's meant to be the 13th best Lego uh, builder in the whole world. Uh, but they do let you know what the home viewers have chosen before the expert judge pronounces his verdict. Now, Paul is saying here, when it comes to the apostles, when it comes to judging between the different Christian leaders, there's no People's Choice Award. Do not judge before the time. When, uh, when Brickman, the, the 13th best Lego man in the world, uh, when he comes to judge the Lego builds, he is actually working with the same information that you and I have. He's simply looking at what they built. What he possesses that's, that's better than you and me is, is greater expertise when it comes to Lego. 
But when it comes to God, he doesn't just have more expertise, although he does have that. But he has access to information that none of us could possibly have. God will shine his light into the secrets of darkness and he will shine his light into our hearts and he understands what our desires and our plans and our intentions are. Uh, this truth is reflected in the wonderful prayer of preparation, which, which has been the collect for Holy Communion uh, at the start of the service uh, ever since the 1600s. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known. I find it very comforting because I do believe we have a great ability to trick ourselves about what our true motives are. And I suspect there are many people out there who achieve good things from bad motives and also vice versa. Now I know that my own motives are deeply mixed and I know that I would not withstand God's examination of my heart if it weren't for the blood of Jesus which cleanses me. I know that very well. But I'm glad that the truth about us all will be exposed. Notice at the end of verse 5, uh, he says, at that time each will receive their praise from God. In other words, although no one will deserve to go to heaven apart from, from Jesus' work for us, no one, will, no one will deserve to go to heaven. We'll all need our sins forgiven. But God will, as a loving Heavenly Father, give credit where credit's due. Everyone will receive their praise from God. And that means that, that I can know if I'm, if I'm forgiven and, and washed clean by Jesus, I know that if I stick at it and keep trying to live the Christian life, keep trusting and obeying, empowered by God's Spirit, then I will on that day receive the well done good and faithful servant. Come on in, Andrew, Jesus will say, and enjoy the happiness that I've prepared for you. What a great day that will be. Well, my fourth and final point is this, and this is really where Paul lands the discussion, that the practical outworking is, don't be puffed up. It's, it's, it's simple, isn't it? You can see there at the end of verse 6, don't be puffed up. See, you remember, Paul is still dealing with that issue that he, he introduced way back in chapter 1, uh, which is where the in fact the Corinthians had this rivalry between the different support groups of the different apostles. Now, Paul has been showing us throughout these chapters how ridiculous this rivalry was. Uh, he showed us in chapter 3, look, the apostles are just farm boys. They're just builders. It's God's field. It's God's building. Now, here in chapter 4, he's showing... Is showing that look, the, the apostles are simply trustees of God's message and it, no one should care about human opinion. But you see, really, this, this rivalry in the Corinthian church, I mean, it's just a natural expression of human pride, isn't it? And human pride will always find an outlet uh, unless it is decisively brought down by the gospel itself. Pride comes naturally to us, as I'm sure that you will know in your own heart. And that is why, in verse 7, Paul gives us really solid doctrine to undercut our pride. He says there in verse 7, Look, who makes you different from anyone else? The answer is, of course, God. Uh, he created us. He created each one of us exactly the way he wanted, with the exact gifts and the exact characteristics that he intended. And he made us for the purposes that he planned. Verse 7 goes on. What do you have that you did not receive? Well, the answer to this rhetorical question is nothing. Everything that I have is what I received from God. And Paul goes on. If you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? You see, I, I would have a right to boast if, if what I have and who I am were from me. But they're not from me. They're from God. I tell you, if, if we only just deeply understood and lived out 
the implications of, of being creatures, of being created by God for his purposes, the way he intended to make us. Well, that would, that would transform our lives. God made me as he chose. He has purposes for me which he chose. And he will judge me according to his own standards. Now this would be bleak news if it were not for the redemption that he has won for everyone who trusts in his son Jesus Christ. As it is, it's very good news. Because it means that I'm freed from human opinion. I'm freed from my own proud, perfectionistic the judgments of myself. I'm freed from having to have rivalries with other people other Christians or other people at all and as a redeemed child of God I can look forward to receiving his praise for the bits that I got right as his servant it's good news isn't it let's pray Heavenly Father we praise you because you know the secrets of our hearts we praise you because you sent your son and entrusted this surprising message, uh, the mystery revealed, to your apostles. And since then you've entrusted it to everyone who has access to your Bible and can pass on this information, uh, this life-saving uh, message to the next generation. Father, we pray for, for me, for our ministry team, uh, for all the Christian leaders uh, amongst us, and for all of our Christian people who are part of our congregation and right around the world, that all of us would prove to be uh, faithful stewards, faithful trustees of this life-saving message. And uh, Heavenly Father, we also pray that we would be freed from, from the rivalry, from, the, from, from condemning ourselves more than you would in, in our perfectionism uh, and from uh, passing judgment on one another when that is your task. Father, please free us from these rivalries and help us, please, uh, to live in, in harmony as we put aside all rivalry uh, and all pride. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.